coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. You're running up and down the aisle saying, you got to love rejection. And even at that young age, I even knew that if I love something, I want more of it. And I didn't want more rejection. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to today's show. On today's show, we have Art Subject, and he is showing how we can smart call and essentially eliminate all that rejection and that fear and that weirdness that's associated with cold calling. You can find out more about Art over at businessbyphone.com. And with all that said, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, Art, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Will, thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here. You're more than welcome, sir. I've got your, I know you can't see it at the moment. I've got your book on the table here next to me, full of notes, absolutely exceptional book. I've read this. I don't even want to know how many years ago I bought this now. I think it's the first edition, so that might date it for from your perspective, Art. But I want to talk about cold calling today, smart calling, um, and I don't want to dwell on this first question that I'm going to ask you, but I'm going to ask you it <laughs> so that we can get it out of the way. So either a one word answer or a short answer on this art, and then we're going to dive into the real fundamentals of all this and some practical takeaways for the audience that they can implement and improve the calling from just listening to this episode. So I'm going to ask it and it's cliche and you've probably answered it a million times over the past like five years. Art, is cold calling dead? The cold is dead, the calling is not. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Okay. So that frames up the conversation. And where I want to start with all this is not necessarily on the cold, warm, the the process side of it. I want to start with the psychology of some of this because it's, and, and I, I fitted into this category when I first started in medical device sales as well. I hated not even cold calling. I hated calling people that expected the call and wanted it. I hated the phone as a platform. And I got through that and rid of that by just doing it over and over and over and forcing myself to get used to it. Is there a reason why we don't like to cold call or warm call or just use the phone? And, you know, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is this linked to rejection? Well, most most definitely it's linked to rejection. And a, a problem in sales in general is that we have so many terms that are negative that screws with our mind even before we start. So for example, rejection. Everybody says that uh, to, to be successful in sales, you gotta love rejection. Well, when I had my first sales job, when I was selling tickets to the policeman's fundraiser circus, we had the typical boiler room, cold call, uh, <laughs> drunk sales manager running up and down the aisle saying, you gotta love rejection. And even at that young age, I even knew that if I love something, I want more of it. And I didn't want more rejection. So the problem with rejection is, is that if, if, if we look at what happens to us in our sales efforts and we call it rejection, obviously we're going to look at it negatively and then we're going to stop the behavior that is causing us to get what we're telling ourselves that we're getting. So for example, if we told ourselves that we suck all day long, we're probably going to start believing, it, right? <laughs> So if if I look at what happens on a sales call as rejection, ultimately what I'm likely going to do is start doubting myself. I'm going to start doubting what I'm doing and I'll probably start um, or, or quit the behavior that's causing me to get those feelings. Let's go a step deeper in this up because this fascinates me. What What is happening in the psychology of this when, when we say these words to ourselves? Is it the linguistics of the words we're saying and can we swap a few words around and take some of that pain away or is it more complex than that? Well, I, I try to simplify it. Uh, some people might try to make it too complex and get into uh, the, the neuropsychology and your know, brain waves and all that, but I'm a pretty simple guy. So I, I look at it two ways, Will. One is let's not call what happens to us on a call rejection. Okay. Let's just look at it as something that was not a fit for that person right at that moment in time. Okay. So, uh, I mean, here's the thing is rejection. What happens to us or the way we define what happens to us? Mm. It's always the way we define it. 
So if we look at something that didn't work and we call it rejection, that's insanity, isn't it? I mean, let's to show how absurd this is, let's put it in a different profession perspective. Let's say an accountant's spreadsheet did not add up. Oh, man, I got rejected by those numbers. <laughs> Uh, a mechanic, a, the, the, a certain way of fixing the engine didn't work, man. I got rejected by that engine. I think I'm, I have engine reluctance now. So it's really kind of absurd to say, okay, well, I got to know. Big deal. So what? I mean, if a uh, basketball player uh, took a shot and missed, which they do most of the time, right? They're, and if they said, oh, I got rejected, and I'm, I'm not going to do it as often. I mean, again, that that's... That's absurd. That's that's insane. So again, I would suggest that we take the word rejection out of our sales vocabulary. Nobody, Eleanor Roosevelt said, nobody can read. Or, nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. So I've changed that slightly to nobody can reject you without your consent. Only you can allow yourself to feel down or rejected based on something that happens to you. So the first thing is, let's not call it. Rejection. So there's the linguistic part. So now there, and I'm doing a lot of talking here. Do you do you want to comment no, on you that? Or keep going. Keep going. I'm I, I'm I'm staring at the monitor watching you now, and I'm I'm intrigued to this myself. Okay. So so the, the second one is, uh, it, so just by the nature of what we do in sales, we are not going to accomplish our primary objective most of the time. Okay, and that's a general way of saying we're going to get a lot of no's. But the thing is about that, big deal, so what? But here's the thing. Most people are not wired to feel okay about a no. So instead of just dwelling on the no, let's get a win of some type every time we pick up the phone or go see somebody face to face for that matter. Now, I always suggest that we have at least two objectives for every call. We have a primary objective, which is what do I want somebody to do as a result of this call? What is the action I want them to take? Okay, so a primary objective would not be, oh, I just want to find out who they're using now. No, that's the means to the end. The primary objective would be at the end of this call, I want to get agreement that they are going to sign my sign my proposal. Okay, they're going to go with my proposal. Or at least I want them to agree that they will go with or they will contact me the next time they have a need for my type of product or service. Okay, so that's a primary objective. So it's what they're doing. Now here's where the not a, not experiencing a rejection comes into play. Let's have a secondary objective every time we pick up the phone. Now this is not do oriented on their part. It is simply attempt oriented on our part. So it could be as simple as uh, I want to. I want to ask them if they uh, would like to stay on my list. I want to keep the door open for a future contact. I at least want to find out who their existing vendor is or when their contract expires. Now, somebody might look at that and go, "Well, geez, that's not earth-shattering stuff." <laughs> Not really, unless you, con you consider a positive attitude to be earth-shattering, which it absolutely is, because. Uh, in, in all my years of doing this, I've found that about 80 to 90 percent of our success is attributable to how we feel when we're doing it. Uh, and most and, professionals. And, and explain that, Art. Explain that from the context of a phone call in the, the kind of the scenario of one individual picks up the phone, gets rejected, and then is like, Ugh, and then they have to make another call versus the other individual who does what you just said, pre frames it. Uh, structures a win into the conversation by making the ask, you know, regardless of the outcome, and they make their next call. What does the two next calls look like? <laughs> well, I think everybody could probably put themselves in that position. The person who felt like they were rejected is going to let that bleed into the next call. So first of all, self-doubt is probably going to creep in going, um, am I any good or even should I be in this profession? all the way down to this lead probably isn't going to be any good. I'm not having a good day and you know, all those negative things. All right. So it, it's kind of hard to fool yourself into being positive after you're telling yourself all the mental trash, right? The person who just got off a call and they say, Hey, you know what? I didn't accomplish my primary, but what I did was, and by the way, I also suggest that you, you do something else on every call. You learn something on every call. You, you, you break down the tape so to speak, even if you're not recording your calls, but which I suggest people do. But if you don't, you ask yourself, what 
what did I like about that call and what would I have done differently? Okay, so I learned something. And the other one is, hey, and at least I accomplished my secondary objective. At least I left the door open for the future. All right, next. Move on to the next one. So now I'm operating from the position. They, what, what just happened to me did not steal my posture away yeah. from me. Okay. I didn't allow that to affect who I am, my self-esteem, my confidence. And it wasn't that what I, what I said wasn't good because I know it's good because I know it's helping already. Again, whatever your number is for your company, hundreds of thousands of people, it just wasn't a fit for that person right at that point. And if there was something that I screwed up, okay, we're going to screw up. Yeah. This just in folks, <laughs> we're, we're going to screw up a call regardless of how good you are. I still screw them up. And you know what you do afterwards is what did I learn from it? And then if you can laugh at it, you, you laugh at it and you go, okay, well, <laughs> I move on to the next one. I want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Or if somebody completely stumped you with a question or, or some resistance, okay, that's going to happen. But then I stop and say, all right, next time I get that, how am I going to handle it? Definitely. So I want to ask you one thing on this, and then I want to move on to the real practical implementation of all this. And super positive attitudes, the how to even describe like more like a bulletproof mindset of things like re rejection hitting the sales professional and just dinging off and going ding 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 and this happening all day it's something that i see as a trait when i speak to super high performers and the elite sales professionals and regular listeners will know this when when i was in medical advice sales i was only ever in the top 70 80 percent of the leaderboard i was always at target but i was never that exceptional salesperson that i know was in these companies and obviously I was trying to, even at the time I was trying to study what was going on and, and what made them different. But one thing I did notice uh, then and I notice now is this ability to to knock off, to not even notice rejection, for it to not even be a thing as you described in your conversation. What I want to ask you Art before we move on to the very practical steps of implementing the structure of the call and that kind of thing, because I think this is important to just dwell on for a second. Is this a learned skill? Is this something that everyone starts off being slightly fearful or nervous of calls uh, for uh, as a sales example and you know develops this positive self talk and this ability to ignore rejection over time or are some people just born better able to cope with this kind of stuff well i mean we can we can go all dr phil here and get into psychology and people's childhoods and, and how they were brought up but but i mean let's face it everybody right now is a product of all the experiences that we've had up to this point in our lives and and certain people might have had a, a lot more of what what we call negative experiences uh and um and, and challenges which they've overcome, which perhaps makes it easier for them now to be in a position where they say, a no, I mean, I lived on the streets, you know, I've been bankrupt, I mean, this is no big deal, okay? I mean, you can, then you can contrast that with a person that maybe um, their entire life, everything was given to them and they went to the best college and they couldn't find a job. Now all of a sudden they're in a sales position where they have to contact people they don't know and, and ask them for things, which they've never had to do in their life. So granted, that person's coming from a different mindset. Now to answer your, answer your question, can, can, can it be learned uh, yeah, but it, 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 some people may have some things they have to unlearn first, and they might have to get rid of some of the baggage and some of the trash to to get over that. Uh, might it be a little bit more difficult for those folks? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's that's the age old question for sales managers: how do you how do you motivate your salespeople? And and of course, the cliche answer to that is hire motivated sales. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've never been in sales management. I've never had that conundrum, but I can, I've been on the other end of it watching people come in and very rapidly out of a company. And I've always wondered that myself. Is it the sales manager's responsibility to be that, to, that epic coach, to be able to turn people around, to be able to change people's lives and thoughts and, and mindsets and mentalities, or is the real skill in hiring the right person in the, full, in, in the first place? Some conversation for another time that art, I think. So let's come on to what you mentioned at the very top of the show, this concept of a cold call, which we all know the stereotype of, we all know, and it's not helped by a whole ton of companies for a marketing spend at trying to convince people that cold calling doesn't work either, even if there's data that suggests it does. So we know the cold call, we know the stereotype of it, we know what the industry is pushing towards and away from. And then you mentioned, um, I'll use your words, a, a warm call. What is the difference between the two? And then we can talk about how we can 
change kind of our prospecting process that is relying on cold calls and, and move them into this area this area of warm? Well, I only like to use the term cold call in in a derogatory negative <laughs> way because to me, a, a, and a cold call should not be placed, by the way. There's absolutely no reason for it. A cold call is calling someone that you don't know, they don't know you, there's been no interaction between you, okay? And on the salesperson side, they are giving a pitch, the same pitch to everybody that they contact. So all of those are, are a recipe for failure. Now, uh, a, a warm call, I, I mean, I'm going to talk about my brand because this is what I've been, been teaching forever. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in terms of a smart call. A smart call is knowing something about the people that we call through research, uh, research both online, offline, and real time, okay? Online would be obviously online, going to the computer and doing the LinkedIn and the Google and um, any of the other sales enable enablement tools. Um, the offline, of course, would be anything that you, some people still read <laughs> papers, <laughs> newspapers, or it, it could be even uh, a referral. Uh, and then the real time research is, is social engineering. Social engineering is calling into a organization and talking to people other than a decision maker for the sole purpose of gathering intelligence. Uh, social engineering was popularized by computer hackers who, who would do it for devious terms. Uh, we do it for reasons to to help the organization. And that's one of the best sources of, of sales intelligence to to help not necessarily warm up the call, but to place a, a smarter call. Now, a warm call, I would put in the category of where there has been some kind of interaction prior to the communication. Either somebody raised their hand, somebody went to uh, you know web page, filled out a form. And although in some cases those aren't even necessarily that warm. <laughs> And big mistakes are made there, by the way. Um, just a quick tip here. Don't call somebody up and say, hey, I see you, you downloaded the white paper from our website. Um, do you have any questions? I mean, that's just, I mean, that that's stupid. Let's, let's uh, just, I, we'll, we'll carry on with the conversation in a second, but let's just touch on this for a second because clearly this is becoming more and more prevalent with leads coming from marketing. It's not a conversation that was at a trade show. It's not a, a referral from another customer that's gone through the marketing process to get to that point. A lot of leads that come from marketing to sales, and I have no personal experience in this. Um, the company that I was at last did no, nothing like this as much as I encouraged them to. So I've not, I've no firsthand experience in this, but what should that call look like? Or how do we qualify that person to see if we should even be calling them at all? Well, I would still suggest that we treat this like a, a prospecting call, a, a smart call. So do you want me to just go through the process? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and by the way, if, if, if we got a lead from marketing, essentially what that tells us is that there was some activity that someone engaged in at, at our site. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that, that that's a great lead or that's even a, 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 a human being or it's good information <laughs> or if the person is not in prison, okay? So we still wanna look at that as I, I, I wanna go through my, my research steps here. So the first thing I'm going to do when I have that lead is I'm gonna go through my process. First thing is I'm going online, I'm, I'm Googling the name, I'm Googling the company, I wanna find out what you, who is this? What, what kind of things might I be able to pull up on them? Uh, if there's a LinkedIn profile, bingo. Now I know that I, I have some kind of individual here. I'm going to go a little bit deeper in that. Okay. I won't go through the, you, know, you probably have had LinkedIn experts on here, so we don't need to go through all that. Uh, also, I'm going to see if there's anything else out there on that person. So I, if they got a social media profile, I mean, all, all of those things. All right. Then I'm going to, uh, of course, analyze what was it that, that, that they had requested. I'm going to see if there are any clues in their profile about uh, if they downloaded a white paper on a certain process. Are, are they in that job? Are they in that process? Would, does that make them somewhat of a lead for me? If there's no connection at all, then I'm thinking, okay, well, then I'm just going to go to my you know, no information kind of strategy. I'm still going to do some social engineering prior to speaking with that person. I might, uh, let's say I'm calling on some kind of SaaS program. I might call into the IT department and uh, talk to a, 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 an operator or user or an admin and find out what they're using now. Okay, so I got some intelligence. 
So then uh, I'm, I'm prepared to, to approach this call. So the way this would look is, um, number one, um, hey, Will, Art Subcheck here with uh, IT Systems. First of all, uh, I, I want to thank you. We received a request for information with your name on it, or we received a, a download request um, uh, on whatever um, that, that had your name on it. Uh, a couple reasons for the call. Um, and actually, even prior to that, this is the no information. Now, if I, I see that that uh, I had some information on them, I would probably touch on that. Sure. Uh, and, and I would say, oh, I, I see that you're the, uh, the, the, the VP, of, you're the IT director at, at ABC Company, and congrats on the, the award that you just won. Yeah, again, small talk based on some relevance, something that's going on in their world. Or if I found out from some social engineering that there's an initiative going on for the type of problem that we solve with that white paper, I might, I might touch on that. Um, so then uh, let, let's go to the no information one. So, the, the, and again, I made fun of the, the other opening, which is, yeah, you downloaded our white paper. Do you have any <laughs> questions? So uh, one thing people have to keep in mind is that a lot of people will put a fake name in there. They might put somebody else's name in there. Uh, or people may not even remember what they downloaded. Yeah. As a, if you're like me, I go into mass information accumulation mode when I'm looking for something. So I'll go and get everything. Okay, if somebody says, "Hey, you downloaded our thing. Do you have any questions?" It's like, you're, you're, "Who? Who are you again?" So what I like to say is, I've been using this one for years. It used to be through the mail. Now, of course, it's it's online. Hey, we received our. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. We have received a request for our white paper on, and it had your name on it. A couple of purposes for the call. Number one, want to make sure that all the questions were answered. And number two, I've got some additional information that you might find useful depending on what you're doing in this area. So now I've kind of covered my bases with people who don't remember. I'm kind of piquing their curiosity a little bit. I'm thanking them. So there's a lot of, I mean, th th I just didn't come up with that off the top of my head. There's a lot of psychology going on in that whole process there. I love this. So I'm letting you talk and I'm I'm holding back on interrupting you, Art, because as, as you said, there's loads of psychology in this and there's lots of, there's lots of steps. So what I'll probably do in the show notes is write this up and and, and narrow it down. Of course, the, the book explains all of this in more detail as a as a process. But something I want to touch on again, which is super relevant, I think, to this conversation of leads coming in from marketing. What kind of response time should we be proactively hunting out for these leads? <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> because I think you summed it up perfectly then. I sign up for stuff. I have no idea about the real company behind it. I understand that it's like a lead generation tool for them. And one, very rarely do I get a call back because any numbers I put in are either fake or it's a UK number. And most of these companies are you know, just, just statistically numbers wise are in the States. So they just don't bother calling me. Um, and maybe they can't dial out internationally. I have, I have no idea. Um, but I never get a call back. And, it, and I understand it's difficult if you've got lots of stuff going on. If you're in the if you're in the B two B enterprise sales side of things, you've got to do your bit of research. But I never get a call back the same day. It's always two or three days later, and then I have forgotten it because you know whether I've read the documentation, whether I've read the article or, or whatever the lead generation tool is, whether I've read it or not, it's kind of out of my psyche at that point. So, uh, are salespeople missing a huge opportunity here to perhaps even just strike while the iron's hot to to, to call it that? Oh, well, I mean, there, there's absolutely no doubt. This actually is, is backed up by science. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips here, but uh, InsideSales.com did some studies on this, and, and not to plug their software here, but they, they have software that is tied into um, to marketing automation where as soon as somebody hits send to request a, a white paper or, or a report, uh, that is immediately routed to a, a salesperson and it automatically dials the phone. I mean, I've had this happen where uh, customers of theirs, I had just requested something. As soon as I hit send, my phone was ringing and the person said, hey, thanks for requesting the white paper. It's like, whoa, I'm looking over my shoulder going, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Um, if somebody doesn't have that, I mean, and, and it blows my mind that uh, particularly with the larger organizations are spending millions of dollars to generate these leads. And then uh, it's taking a few days till a salesperson gets them. Or uh, I, I guess I would blame this maybe on, on sales management if, they, if it's their fault, where there's not the encouragement to jump on those instantly. I mean, let's everybody let's let's just step back for a second and think about as a consumer when you decide that okay, I need a guy to fix this for me. Okay, so immediately at that moment we start looking for that person. When is your interest highest on, on having and talking to somebody that's going to fix that problem for you? Right at that very moment. So if I don't, if I'm not able to reach somebody right at that very moment, uh, my interest is going to go down in speaking with somebody as time goes on. Okay. And the person who contacts me first is likely going to have the greatest chance of, of getting the business. I mean, I've written about this before. I had something here at my house and I called like four different contractors. I had one that was referred by somebody else and I just got a recording um, and I left my information. I reached somebody that I just found on Angie's list or something like that. And this guy answered the phone. He closed me right there and he was here working at my house within an hour. The other guy called me two days later. <laughs> I I see this art from not that I think I'm important or I think that you know I'm I'm doing particularly well or anything like that just to just to frame what I'm going to say now but as I become busier and busier as the show gets bigger and there's more requests and pulls for my time I found that anything as a like out of the world of sales anything that I'm doing as a consumer for example I had to upgrade all our um, storage solutions the other day this is a great example I perhaps a year ago would have been more focused on my budget. I would have been more focused on the the service and the, the timeframes and all this kind of stuff. And I would have, you know, searched out a better deal. I would have been a, probably a really bad, a really bad buyer for a salesperson on the other end of the phone because, you know, there wasn't the imperative to get it all done. It just, it was a, it was a infrastructure upgrade that needed doing, but, you know, there's no real pressure there. Whereas literally <laughs> this, this happened this uh it was on saturday it arrived but we ran out of hard drive space to record the show so all the shows recorded in 4k so that the future proofed we can come back pull content from them and it takes up a, a tremendous amount of storage so mm. now that again not that i think i'm you know super uh, you know important or, or or busy but as my time as, as my time is kind of demanded by more people by the audience by sponsors by everything else that we're doing outside of just the podcast I just bought a super expensive solution, just bought it to the first company that came back to me and got a big network attack storage device. And that, that was gobbledygook for 99% of the audience, just a set of hard drives that are plugged into the, the network in the in the house to record everything onto. And I wasn't bothered about price. Obviously I had a budget, but I just wanted the first person that got back to me was a rep from a guy from a company called Synology. They came, they sent it out the next day. The got on the phone with me. Uh, it's not a big enough enterprise solution to send an engineer out or anything like that, but they got on the phone with me, they set it up, and it's done. And I probably could have got it for half the price if I built a similar solution myself, which I may have done 12 months ago. So the point of telling that tale is, if you're dealing with a CEO of the C-suite who are genuinely busy, who are genuinely pulled for maybe even thousands of people internally and externally after their time, it's... It's crazy how important that rapid response and you know rapid value up front and showing your expertise up front, these has all become more and more. Or tell me, tell me if I'm right here. Uh, but I feel like these become more and more important and, and tangible value adds and benefits for a salesperson to be able to offer the higher up the food chain of the individual that you're trying to prospect to. Well put. And I have a great <laughs> and I'm glad you agreed. That could have been really awkward then if you'd said no, you're wrong. <laughs> well, and, and let's just, I mean, let's turn back the clock and, and I, I, I'd like to use this term people 1.0. <laughs> let, let, let's get back to people 1.0. We want to do business with people that we feel want to do business with us and are interested in us. And isn't it impressive to receive some personalized attention to somebody that with, within a few minutes after making a request, somebody actually gets back to us quickly yeah. and shows interest in working with us and solving our problem? 
Boy, there's there's some rocket science, isn't it? <laughs> right, Art, there's a couple of questions I want to ask before um, we wrap up the show. I have to ask them every episode. But I want you to come back on to dive into this topic of social engineering. So I've had, on uh, it was you know 18 months ago now, we had someone to talk about this topic, but it was from the, as you described, the, the kind of hacker mentality. So I want you to come on in a future episode and talk about it from the race-specific sales side of things because I think that's an important topic. But what I've taken away from our conversation today, Art, is, and, and tell me again if I'm right or wrong with this, it seems like whether you're making a call, call uh, a warm call, a cold call, an email, uh, you know, meeting someone in, pub, in, in public at a, an event face-to-face, is the most important thing of all of this and the thing that we're missing, is it just having context on that person and context on how we can help them? Is that is that a real you know op- opportunity for us to add value to our customers that we're just not leveraging as well as we should do? Yes, yeah. It's I mean it's really quite simple. I mean it goes back to Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. Who's who, who are people most interested in themselves, and how what they're going to do next will affect them. And if I mean let's take two scenarios. I call you up. Hey, Will, I want you to listen to this thing I have. It's all about me. Uh, scenario one. Hey, Will, uh, I, I've got this thing. It's all about you. Uh, would you like to listen to it? <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's that's oversimplifying it, but but essentially that that's what we're talking about here, and and that's what people get away from. I think people are so interested in 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 selling their thing and pitching their thing and their their webinar, or their meeting, or their whatever that they forget to focus on. Who is this person? What is it about them that might make them interested in what I have? And how can I relate to them in such a way that I can at least get them talking so that I can find out more about them and then I can explain how it might be of some value to them? Definitely, definitely. I appreciate that, Art. And a couple of questions before we you tell us a little bit more about the book and where we can find out more about you. First one, other than your book, which we'll come on in a second, we'll touch on in a second, what are some books or resources that you'd recommend to the sales and podcast audience? Not necessarily about calling, but on on any kind of standout subject that you think is important for our audience. Well, one that I always recommend that I try to go back and, and read at least once a year is uh, the classic called Influence by Robert Cialdini. And because because let's let's face it, everybody sells and influences in in their life. And and Cialdini in his classic book, and he's got a couple that have come out since then, which which are all good. But but basically, it's all about human behavior. And and what we're trying to do is we're we're trying to influence, we're trying to establish credibility, we're trying to persuade, and do it in such a way where we're helping people feel like it was their idea. So <laughs> that is a classic. And then, uh, I mean, I probably got almost every single sales book that, that, that's ever been published and, and to, to just let me let me, to let me let me rephrase this then. What is one sales book that you've read from either when you first started reading and consuming this content to now that you read and you went, wow, that that's a game changer? Uh, strictly a sales book? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I would say one that, that influenced me, and it's a classic and, and it's still around, but this was back early in my career when it first came out. And somebody had asked me about it the other day, and, and that's spin selling. And and spin selling essentially, obviously, is is asking questions before you're making a, a recommendation. And then it goes deep into the different types of questions that, that you're asking. Today, I would think that most sales training programs incorporate elements of the, the, the spin technique, not obviously copying it, but doing it in such a way where we're simply trying to get people to 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 talk about their, their pains, their problems, the, the solutions they're looking for, uh, and, and all those things. So if I had to pick one, that was one that, that kind of shaped me when I was first starting my business back uh, in the, the mid-80s. Amazing stuff. Well, we'll link to both of them in the show notes. And Art, I've got one final question for you. It's something to ask everyone that comes on the show, and that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? I would say think bigger. Think bigger, act bigger. I've done pretty well in my career, and I believe I've, I've followed that philosophy. But that is one instant way for people to achieve greater results. Most people fly way too close to the ground, including myself. 
And if, if I look back, if, if I would have done that earlier um, on, on a micro level, just on the, the deals that anybody is working on, going to a higher level within an organization, asking for a bigger sale, asking for a longer term on the contract and everything that you're shooting for in life. Just think a little bit bigger. The math works on that. Even if you don't get what you're, you're aiming for, you're going to come in higher than you would have otherwise if, if you thought small. Definitely. I've got, I'll end with this. I've got a a quick story in that at all the time now I'm getting asked to do speaking gigs and things of that nature. Uh, as the the brand grows, people are more interested in getting in front of my audience than probably than having me there as a personality. So clearly any speaking gigs I do get talked about on the show leading up to the event. And um, there's a whole bunch of event coverage that we're doing. There's a whole lot of stuff that the audience, Sales Nation, don't know what's happening at the moment because I'm not ready to talk about it. But middle of 2017 onwards there's going to be a whole bunch of opportunities for us to hang out and loads of cool stuff and the first time i got asked to speak at an event was last year um that was teeing up an event for this year and the guy had me on the phone and um, i'm not going to say what event it was uh which will be clear why in a second but he got me on the phone he's like do you want to come and speak to this event and he was speaking quite slow and uh before i could jump at him and say yeah yeah of course you know and he was like well we'll pay for your hotel and travel it's over in the states so in my brain, I'm like, immediately, you know, I'll, I'll tack a day or two on or we'll come to some arrangement so I can spend a bit more time in the States and do some sightseeing in the, in the epic city that it's based in. And then, then his next question was, and how, how much, what, what's your fee? And of course, I was going to do it completely for free. I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't even comprehend that I was going to get paid for it. In my mind, I'd, I'd framed public speaking as it's a two or three year of doing free gigs uh, speaking for free and then you can start to like ramp up the the cash after the fact and um so i just threw the first number that came to my head out at him um i think it was five thousand dollars then that was just the first thing that came to me and immediately he said yes there was no hesitation he was obviously thinking you know we, we charge we charge people are charging us double for less of an audience and you know clearly they're going to be better public speaker than what i am when i'm at the beginning of this kind of public speaking journey but he, there was no hesitation and immediately I knew that I'd that like, screwed up on that phone call and as as to speaking to yourself as to going bigger if I just had a bit more confidence in myself if I'd have gone into that conversation with a higher number and worked backwards from it I would have probably <laughs> probably got double uh, the cash for for doing the event itself so and, and, I, and I think this is going to continue to be a topic and a theme on the show art because you're not the first person who said that and you know clearly you're successful You've got a great platform. You've got a great book. You've got, um, you know, years and, and decades of experience behind all this. And when you say that, it really kind of resonates with me that us listen to the audience. Typically, the audience is a bit younger. It's the millennial kind of uh, group. Uh, I don't think, I, I think we perhaps limit ourselves more than what we should. So I appreciate that answer, Art. And with that, mate, I want you to tell us a little bit more about the book, where we can find it, and then where we can find out more about you as well. For everyone that's super excited uh, to learn more about the the process that you put in place of all of this. Sure, you can. I, I've got a site set up for the book. I actually don't sell the book myself. It uh, is smart dash calling dot com smart dash calling dot com and what we'll do there is if 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 you click through to Amazon on that site then you can also come back to the site and we've got some free training that we'll provide for you right there. So we've, we've got some uh, video training that, that we'll provide. So you can get the book there uh, or of course at uh, any other site that, that you like. And then also I've got a blog, which is smartcalling.com, smartcalling.com. I've got tons of posts there. We've been blogging for forever. I've got an email newsletter that goes out every week with sales tips. And uh, also I do some YouTube videos in there. Seems like a couple couple a month. Uh, we make those entertaining. As well as I've got a, uh, a book of 501 sales tips. It's a free ebook. So you can get that at smartcalling.com as well. And then also there, you can click through to my main site, which is businessbyphone.com. I, I make my living speaking and training I have for, for 33 years. So if anybody's interested in that, I've got tons of, of different resources in whatever format somebody might be interested in. Amazing stuff. We'll link to all that in the show notes over at salesman.red. And with that, our absolute pleasure having you on the show, mate. We'll have you back on to dive into social engineering. I think that is a it, that is, and again, we'll we'll save it for another time. But I think that's a step 
the very few B2B sales professionals are implementing that has massive, obviously it's a time suck at first that you've got to invest into the relationship, into the conversation. But anyone doing account-based selling, clearly there's a huge upside to that. So we'll have you back on to talk about that in more detail. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Art, for your time, for your insights and for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's been an honor and I am looking forward to coming back. And there we have it, Art. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing your expertise on this. It's an interesting subject, this area of turning cold calls into warm calls. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. I want to thank you guys, as always, Sales Nation, for tuning in, for supporting the show, for sharing it with your sales colleagues and helping us grow. And with all that said, I'll speak with you again on tomorrow's episode.